In the late 1950s, renowned paleoanthropologists Lewis and Mary Leakey made a discovery that would forever change their lives and the face of science. Nestled in the ever-popular Old Duvai Gorge, amidst the rugged terrain of Tanzania, the couple unearthed the fossilized remains of a never-before-seen species. Unknown to them, they had discovered one of the earliest members of the human family. Named Homo habilis, this species would shock the world as it turned science on its head and redefined what it means to be a part of the human family. But what exactly do they look like? Why was their discovery so controversial? And in an extremely shocking twist, how did a set of fossils 2.4 million years ago help us understand how we use tools today? Found in the Old Duvai Gorge of Tanzania, a region popular for the discovery of hominin fossils, the Homo habilis was discovered in the early 1960s by Kenyan-British paleoanthropologist and archaeologist Lewis Seymour Bazet Leakey and his wife, British paleoanthropologist Mary Douglas Leakey. Although discovered in the early 1960s, the story of the Homo habilis discovery actually started many years before. See, starting in the late 1930s, Lewis and Marie Leakey discovered the remains of many extinct animals, including the 25-million-year-old Proconsul primate. This is one of the first ancient ape skulls ever found as a fossil. However, during that period, the couple would also begin discovering stone tools in Olduvai and other places. However, as they searched, their work at Olduvai Gorge was briefly stopped by political problems in nearby Kenya. But luckily, they returned in the late 1950s. While interested in ancient tools, they became increasingly curious about the people who made them. And in the early 1960s, they found what they were looking for. On the morning of the discovery, Lewis was feeling unwell at camp, and so Mary ventured out alone to continue their search for fossils. While exploring the area, Mary came across some intriguing fossilized remains near bed one of Olduvai Gorge. Among these fossils, Mary noticed something different, a set of bones that appeared to belong to a previously unidentified hominid species. These bones included a lower jaw, two skull fragments, and several bones from the hands and feet, catalogued as OH7. These remains, dating back to about 1.75 to 2.1 million years ago, suggested mind-blowing features that distinguished them from other known hominid species, leading Mary to believe that she had discovered a new and significant find. Upon further excavation and analysis, the Leakeys determined that these fossils represented a new species of early human, which they named Homo habilis, meaning handy human, due to the fact that they suspected these species to be responsible for the stone tools they had previously found. Years of research and excavation would follow, with more and more fossils being unearthed. And finally, the Homo habilis was accepted as its own species after Leakey's son Richard, in 1972, discovered another Homo habilis, often called Turkana boy, or ER-1470. The fossil dated to 1.9 million years ago and helped solidify the belief that Homo habilis was not only part of the human family tree, but also one of the oldest on the tree. And, more interestingly, one of the first human ancestors to use tools, which today is a significant milestone in human evolution. Today, fossils attributed to Homo habilis have also been found at Hadar, Ethiopia, Kubifora, and Kenya. So, what did the Homo habilis look like? When it comes to Homo habilis, there was a lot to discover, leaving many scientists puzzled for years. For example, Homo habilis is believed to have exhibited sexual dimorphism. This essentially means that there was a difference in size depending on whether they were male or female, with males being bigger and heavier. In fact, males were believed to stand at around 5 feet 2 inches and weigh in at approximately 114 pounds, while comparatively smaller females stood at about 4 feet 1 inch and weighed around 70 pounds. Besides size, the Homo habilis also exhibited a dynamic blend between the earlier Australopithecus and the hominins that followed until the humans we see today. Like the proverbial Bigfoot of the science community, the Homo habilis was a sort of bridge connecting the two and foreshadowing the evolutionary developments to come. When compared to the Australopithecus genus, the shape of Homo habilis's skull, face, and teeth was more delicate, suggesting an evolutionary leap forward. However, that wasn't the only surprise discovery. 
as their teeth were similar to ours, suggesting they might have changed their diet and even started cooking food. Moving on from the skull, the Homo habilis's bones also show in depth just how they adapted to their environment and developed new skills. For example, their long arms suggest they still spent time in trees like their ancestors, but their hands were great for making and using tools because they could grip well. Besides that, changes in their hip and neck bones also suggest they faced challenges during childbirth, so their bodies adapted to make it easier. Speaking of adapting to the environment, what kind of environment did the Homo habilis evolve in? Homo habilis was not confined to one location, but ranged across different regions of Africa. Although initially found in places like Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania, their remains have been discovered at various East African sites, such as Kubifora in Kenya and Ethiopia. To make things even crazier, evidence suggests they might have also inhabited sites in South Africa, like Sturkfontein and possibly Swartkrantz. The leading theory is that around 2.5 million years ago, climatic changes in southern Africa likely prompted Homo habilis, or its ancestors, to migrate northward toward the East African Rift Valley. This theory stands mainly because the Olduvai Gorge, where Homo habilis once lived, resembled today's Serengeti, with savanna grasslands interspersed with scrub, bushes, and some woody plant cover. Forced to move, the Homo habilis likely interacted with their environment in various ways. While there's no direct evidence of living structures at Olduwan sites, it's speculated that Homo habilis, being adept climbers, might have slept in trees to avoid predators on the ground. At the time, Homo habilis shared their world with other species, including Australopithecus africanus, Homo rudolfensis, Paranthropus boisei, and even Homo erectus, although the nature of their interactions with each other remains uncertain. Moving from South Africa to East Africa not only affected their way of life, but also what they ate. See, the Homo habilis diet was diverse, consisting of insects, grass-eating animals, fruits, and even meat. Thanks to their fossils, their teeth showed signs of chewing tough and fibrous foods, indicating a versatile diet. Cut-marked bones also suggest they were skilled hunters or scavengers. The discovery of the Olduwan industry, the oldest known stone tool industry associated with Homo habilis, provided additional insight into their behavior, as evidence suggests that they concentrated stone material and animal bones at certain locations. These concentrations could indicate the presence of home bases or central foraging areas. But that was not all, as the use of stone tools would have increased their independence from their environment and may have led to the development of cultural practices. While the use of fire and language among Homo habilis remains speculative, evidence of burnt bones and fire-cracked stones at Olduwan sites hints at the possibility that Homo habilis might have used fire. However, whether this was deliberate or the result of natural causes like lightning strikes remains uncertain. Similarly, the development of a proto-language or communication system among Homo habilis is unclear, with no direct evidence yet discovered. However, their tool-making abilities suggest cognitive complexity and the potential for cultural evolution. Some scientists also believe that, like kids today, Homo habilis kids had to be taught social norms and survival skills. Their claims are backed up by the fact that Homo habilis was the first species to exhibit enlarged brokers and Wernicke's areas, which are the cortical areas specialized for the production and comprehension of human language. As such, it's completely plausible that they possessed the motor control necessary for increased tongue movement and the ability to understand the sounds they could produce as a result. For the Homo habilis, an important trait to their survival and classification into the human family is the adaptive prowess that lies in their technological innovations, notably in the Olduwan tool industry, dating back approximately 2.6 to 1 million years ago. Initially identified by the Leakies in the 1960s, the Olduwan tools are primarily associated with Homo habilis, but they also overlap with other Homo species, like Homo rudolfensis, and Homo erectus, as well as with later Australopithecans. These tools, mostly made from broken rocks, changed how early humans worked, helping with tasks like cutting up big animals. They included different types like choppers, polyhedrons, and discoids, made by hitting rocks together or using them as hammers on other rocks. While the specific function of these tools remains speculative, 
Cut marks on animal bones provide insights into their use for processing carcasses of diverse sizes, from small mammals to large mammals like elephants. But in a surprising twist, recent discoveries at Dikika, Ethiopia, and Lomekwi, Kenya, have pushed back the origins of stone tool making to approximately 3.3 to 3.39 million years ago, predating the emergence of the Homo genus. Moving on from hunting, there has been additional evidence of architectural structures, such as rock piles, dating to 1.75 million years ago, suggesting that there were rudimentary construction practices among early Homo populations, further highlighting their adaptive ingenuity in prehistoric landscapes. But how was this ancient species so sophisticated? Well, their constructive and technological prowess was primarily due to their brains and how they functioned. Thankfully, we know this because new studies examining the endocranial casts of Homo habilis from Aldervai Gorge have shed light on the brain's evolution in early hominins. Compared to other East African hominids, Homo habilis is quite exciting as it exhibited a significantly larger endocranial capacity, surpassing even the mean size of Australopithecan species by a substantial margin. This expansion in brain size, quantified through various metrics like Gerasen's NC and EQ and Hemmer's CC, represents a remarkable, rare genetic trait of Homo, signaling a disproportionate enlargement of the brain. Further analysis of their brain size and structure has revealed significant transverse expansion of the cerebrum, particularly in the frontal and parieto-occipital regions, accompanied by increased volume in the frontal and parietal lobes, a distinctive characteristic observed solely in Homo. Besides this, the endocasts of a Homo habilis exhibit a unique pattern of grooves and ridges in the frontal lobe, similar to what is seen in later Homo species and humans of today. The Homo habilis also showed notable development of the inferior parietal lobule, a feature that is also found only in the Homo family. Essentially for its time, the Homo habilis brain was essentially an evolutionary tank slowly evolving and learning in ways that not only reflect who we are today, but also the significant evolutionary journey it took to get to us today. With that said, the question stood, how did this evolutionary brain affect their behavior, mannerisms, and culture? And what was its evolutionary implication? The evolution of Homo habilis's brain had significant implications for their behavior, mannerisms, and culture. With the expansion and development of their brains, the Homo habilis likely experienced advancements in cognitive abilities, including problem solving, communication, and tool use. This could have influenced their social interactions, allowing for more complex relationships and cooperative behaviors within their communities. Furthermore, the enlargement of specific brain regions, such as the frontal and parietal lobes, may have contributed to the development of unique skills and behaviors. For example, the enhanced development of the frontal lobe associated with decision-making and social cognition might have led to more sophisticated social structures and cultural practices. But that's not all, as the prominence of the inferior parietal lobule would have facilitated spatial awareness and contributed to their ability to navigate their environment and create more elaborate tools. Essentially, in terms of evolutionary implications, the evolution of a larger and more complex brain in Homo habilis marked a significant milestone in hominin evolution. It represented a shift towards greater cognitive complexity and adaptability, enabling Homo habilis to thrive in diverse environments and exploit new resources. This evolutionary advancement laid the foundation for subsequent species within the Homo genus, leading to the emergence of even more sophisticated tool technologies, social structures, and cultural practices. Essentially, their brains laid the foundation for who we are today. But then, with such a title attributed to the species, the new question stands. Why is its inclusion in the Homo family tree debated? To understand why the Homo habilis place in the Homo family tree is disputed, first we need to look at what it means to be in the Homo family in the first place. The classification of Homo habilis within the Homo family tree is a subject of debate due to its complex mix of characteristics and transitional features. Essentially, some researchers argue that it shares traits with both earlier Australopithecus species and later Homo species, making its classification challenging. One point of contention is the significance of its anatomical features, particularly its brain size. 
While Homo habilis has a larger brain size than Australopithecus species, it falls below the traditional threshold for inclusion in the Homo genus, based on brain size alone. This discrepancy raises questions about the criteria used to define Homo species. But that is not all, as ongoing discoveries of new fossils and advancements in anatomical methods continuously reshape our understanding of human evolution. As more evidence emerges, interpretations may change, leading to ongoing debates and revisions in the classification of Homo habilis within the broader context of human evolutionary history. To grasp why Homo habilis's place in the Homo family is disputed, it's essential to first understand the criteria for belonging to the Homo genus. From the perspective of Homo classification, species within the genus typically exhibit certain key traits, including increased brain size, the use of tools, and potentially more complex social behaviors. However, Homo habilis presents a challenge because its characteristics do not neatly fit into these criteria. One factor contributing to the debate is the variability observed within the fossil record attributed to Homo habilis. Different specimens show variations in cranial morphology, dentition, and limb proportions, leading to questions about whether these differences represent intraspecific variation or multiple distinct species. Moreover, the interpretation of tool use and cultural behaviors associated with Homo habilis is subject to interpretation. While stone tools are often found in association with Homo habilis fossils, the extent of their toolmaking abilities and the sophistication of their cultural practices remain uncertain. Additionally, the discovery of new hominin species and the refinement of dating techniques have challenged previous hypotheses about the evolutionary relationships between different taxa. As a result, the placement of Homo habilis within the Homo genus continues to be re-evaluated in light of new evidence and theoretical frameworks. Ultimately, the debate surrounding Homo habilis underscores the complexity of human evolution and the need for interdisciplinary approaches to address questions about species, classification, behavior, and evolutionary relationships within the Homo genus. Essentially, the handyman of prehistoric times was a whole lot more than a walking ape. Standing as our oldest ancestor, the Homo habilis has proven to the world how long it took to get to where we are today. But what do you think? Should the Homo habilis be added to the Homo family, or should it be included as a family of its own? Let us know in the comment section below. And while you're at it, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more prehistoric knowledge. Until next time, stay curious.